This week's tale briefly discusses a lynching and several other horrific things. Discretion advised, please check the blog post on historyandimagination.com first if this is likely to affect you. This week's tale opens on an ugly siege. The date, September 9th, 1925. The location, 2905 Garland Street, Detroit, Michigan. The 11 men and women inside the house have provoked the ire of the Waterworks Improvement Association. The offense? Daring to move into, in air quotes, a nice neighborhood. In spite of a police presence, a large mob gathered across the road at the school on the 8th. The mob had grown even larger on the second night. Truthfully, the police were only there to say the police were in attendance, and that they had tried their best. When improvement clubs or neighborhood associations are established, the police usually watch impassively. When people are hurt or killed, or properties are razed to the ground, it's astonishing how often they were dealing with something else and were sadly facing in the wrong direction at the time. Inside the house, the new owner, his wife Gladys, two of his brothers and a handful of friends. Heavily outnumbered, at least the besieged had guns and a large supply of ammunition. Just after 11pm, the Waterworks Improvement Association made their move. Yelling and hollering, the mob descended upon the house, throwing rocks at the property. As two windows were smashed and the mob were getting too close to the property for comfort, the besieged fired a fusillade of gunfire into the rabble. A man in a crowd was felled. Panicked, the mob dispersed. A ten-year-old neighbor later describing how the streets were too narrow to contain the hurried retreat. Now, of course, the dozen police officers did get themselves involved and arrested the eleven in the house immediately. The occupant was one Ossian Sweet, a 30-year-old doctor, recently returned from Austria and France. The real reason of the violent reception from the Waterworks Improvement Association, while well, Ossian, Gladys, and their young child were all African Americans, moving into an all-white neighborhood. Born in 1895 in Bartow, Florida, to working-class parents, Ossian grew up well aware of the horrors of a system that continued to discriminate against black Americans. The brief Reconstruction era post-US Civil War failed to bring long-lasting equality. Jim Crow America reverted to a system apt to subjugate, criminalize, and on occasion to execute members of a group it saw as either perpetual children or as animals. Aged five, Sweet witnessed a horrific lynching while hiding behind a bush. The victim was a black man. He was tied to a stake and then burnt alive to a rapturous crowd. As was often the case, onlookers took mementos from the killing, tearing pieces of burnt flesh from the body. Though I couldn't tell you why this particular man was murdered. Somewhere in the order of 5,000 Americans, mostly black, were lynched in the Jim Crow era for anything from accusations of murder through to flirting with a white woman. Now, Ossian was living in a time of some positive change, however. His grandparents had been slaves. His parents labored for wages, and he would become a physician. The year he was born, Booker T. Washington, the famed educator who founded the Tuskegee Institute, gave a speech known as the Atlanta Compromise. In the speech, he called for young black people to take up vocational training in working class trades. He called for young intellectuals to stop agitating against the separate but equal Jim Crow laws and to step away from higher education or aspirations of political office. In return, he called on the white community to get fully behind the upskilling of the black community. His biggest rival, fellow educationalist W.E.B. Du Bois, called the compromise out, pointing out it would embed the black community forever as second-class citizens in America. His rival plan, to ensure the talented 10th, the smartest 10% of black kids, got higher educations and entered the higher professions. Ossian and his brothers were of that 10%. 
Age 13, he was sent to live in Ohio. He studied at Wilberforce University, America's first black university, before enrolling in medical school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. While at university, Ossian witnessed another horrific incident. A black man was pulled from a streetcar by a white mob just blocks from his campus. Far from a one-off, this was a small part of what became known as the Red Summer. The First World War breaking out in Europe was an economic boon for the industrial cities in the north of the USA, something particularly true of car manufacturers. While the Jeep was a whole world war away, armor-plated vehicles, Ford Model Ts among them, were just flying off the production lines. There were barely enough men in the factories as it was when the USA entered the war in 1917. To keep the production lines going, factories had sent recruiters into the South to find able-bodied men. The Great Migration, a mass relocation north for tens of thousands of black Americans, had begun a few years earlier, but this accelerated the process immensely. The African American population of Detroit for example, grew 20-fold between 1910 and 1930. While the first Great Migration brought hundreds of thousands of black Americans northwards, it also brought similar numbers of white southerners. Many of these new arrivals carried with them the white supremacist beliefs of the Ku Klux Klan, and this led, in turn, to a rise in white supremacist activity in the north. One example, the Detroit chapter of the KKK alone had a hundred thousand members, and even nearly got one of their own, Charles S. Bowles, elected as mayor. Being uncertain times, formerly fringe ideas spread easily in the North. A wave of white supremacist violence towards black people in dozens of cities was the result. Whenever black people tried to band together for protection, they were branded especially in the press, as Bolsheviks, or at least in league with communists and anarchists. Now, a number of civil rights leaders were socialists, but this was rhetoric meant to scare everyday white people into backing the KKK in their violent behavior. The Klan violence had everything to do with some white people objecting to working and living alongside black people, and had very little to do with reds under the bed. At least 250 black Americans were murdered, hundreds more injured in the Red Summer. Dr. Sweet moved to Detroit in 1921, setting up a practice in Black Bottom, an overpopulated black neighborhood. He met and fell in love with Gladys Mitchell. The two married in 1923 and for a while moved to Europe, where Ossian continued his studies. On their return, now with a young child, they sought out a home of their own. Time and again, they were turned away from white, middle-class homes and wealthier neighborhoods. Though the North was not segregated in quite the same way as the South, local government bodies could enact all kinds of ordinances, making it difficult for black people to buy into white neighborhoods. Sellers would often raise the price for black buyers without consequence, too. When the couple bought 2905 Garland Street in June 1925, in a white, working-class neighborhood, they grudgingly paid more than $18,500 for a property valued at only around $12,500 to a white buyer. As soon as word got out a black family were moving in, locals formed an improvement association. Under the pretense they were meeting to discuss the neighborhood's water pipes. Plans were soon underway, as with numerous other improvement associations before them, to violently force the suites out back into the overcrowded black neighborhoods. Now given what I've said so far, and I'm sure it won't have escaped many people's attention, this is February, Black History Month. I am very wary of introducing a white savior figure into this tale, but I needs must introduce Clarence Darrow. Known as the attorney for the damned, Clarence Darrow really was a remarkable figure. Born in Ohio in 1857, Darrow came from a family of abolitionists and free thinkers. 
and very much carried on their tradition. I won't say too much on him today, and I will come back to Clarence for a future tale or two. But if you can imagine the most stereotypical television geniuses of the last few decades, unkempt, non-conformist, too damn good at their job to be let go for their eccentricities. Well, you're in the right ballpark for Mr. Darrow. His nickname says it all, really. If Clarence Darrow couldn't help you, nobody could. In the wake of the arrests, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, the NAACP, held fundraisers in cities across the North and secured the money to hire Darrow to defend the Sweet family and their co-defendants. Initially, all 11 accused were tried together. In the courtroom, in front of a jury of a dozen white men, Darrow argued not just the Sweets were defending their property as the laws allowed them to, but they were the victims of a system stacked against them due to the colour of their skin. In his autobiography, he makes mention of the fact the prosecution called up to 75 witnesses, who all claimed they were out on the street and saw the shooting, but claimed there was no large crowd of people, and let's just let that sink in for a while. Darrow struggled to find witnesses due to the neighbourhood closing ranks, but made easy work of the prosecution witnesses and cross-examination. With the odds stacked against him, the media firmly on the side of the white mob, most of Detroit's leading citizens on their side, Darrow still secured a hung jury. When the case was retried, this time individually trying the sweets, starting with Ossian's older brother Henry, the shooter. Darrow won the case, leading to the state's attorney dropping the charges against the other defendants. Now were this a movie, this is the point where the family live happily ever after. They're released immediately. Cut to scene of a party with some hot jazz playing on the gramophone. Perhaps a white saviour lawyer is there as a guest of honour. The neighbours have learnt the foolishness of their ways, and Dr. Sweet is welcomed into the community as one of their own. This, this was, however, real life. Once arrested, the defendants were refused bail. In the dank, miserable jail cells, Gladys Sweet caught tuberculosis and passed away soon after. But not before she inadvertently passed the disease to their child who also died from consumption. Ossian Sweet resumed his medical practice, but never returned to 2905 Garland Street. He never really got over the incident, or the loss of his family. Ossian Sweet sold the house in the 1950s, and feeling all too world-weary, took his own life in 1960. Though hardly the most uplifting tale, the story of Ossian Sweet is something that keeps coming back to me. Not to say he wasn't a remarkable guy. To become a doctor requires a high level of smarts. To remain calm in the face of a raging mob incredible toughness. But I think that this experience was not uncommon, it makes it chilling to me. There is something of this that feels too current for comfort. As a final word, Clarence Darrow appealed to the better nature of the jury when he said, To me this case is a cross-section of human history. It involves the future, and the hope of some of us that the future shall be better than the past. While in the box, Ossian Sweet also made a statement. I opened the door, I saw the mob, and I realized I was facing the same mob that has hounded my people throughout our entire history. I was filled with the same fear only one could experience who knows the history and strivings of my race.